Hey guys, welcome to lecture number seven of this bioinformatics series. I'm Dr. Vandenbrink, Dr. VDB. Um, today we're going to be talking a bit about charts and graphs. Um, one of the things that I, I've you know, waxed poetic about R throughout this entire course, um, R is very, very good at certain topics. Like I said in the last one, great language for statistics. There's tons of statistics packages, um, and ours, that's kind of one of the foundations of R is being able to do statistical analysis. And that's kind of where bioinformatics comes in, where um, the statistics associated with gene expression and building phylogenies and stuff, R handles that very well. Um, the other thing that R is great at is creating graphics. So um, you might notice that if you were to go and read a um, nature or science publication um, and look at those beautiful figures that those authors often have in those publications that they don't look like they're made in Excel. You can like you can spot an Excel graph a mile away, right? They're really basic. They all generally look the same. Um, but R is awesome at producing very nice customizable graphics, very polished, um, able to be polished and, and look uh, very nice. Um, so we're going to just scratch the surface on some of the basic plotting functions. Additionally, there are some packages that really you can get into the weeds and make some really cool figures like ggplot um, and plotter and, and things like that. Um, or um, the other one I liked is, um, oh, I can't even remember the name of it. That's embarrassing. Isaac? Don't know? Okay. Well, um, well, let's uh, get into it then, as I'm at a loss for words. Okay, so to start here, I'm gonna clear out all that stats stuff that we did from the last lecture. And I'm going to annotate, and I'm gonna say uh, charts and graphs. And this is gonna be pretty superficial. There's a ton of different charts and graphs and, and things that you can do in R. Um, but like I said, in this first unit, we're just kind of getting getting the ball rolling, getting you familiar with, with what's possible, how the basics of R works, and then uh, we'll get more into the weeds as we go. So the first thing is I'm going to call the names of Iris, right? So we had Iris loaded from the last lecture, um, and that was our kind of flower data set where we had uh, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and the species. Um, and so I'm going to do a histogram. So you're all are probably familiar with histograms. Um, they are, you know, shows us the frequency, uh, a frequency distribution. So if I run this over on the right hand side behind, I'm going to move myself up for this lecture. Um, so behind where I was, uh, down here, we see that uh, we have a histogram showing the sepal length, and we have bins at four, five, six, seven, and four, five, six, seven, and eight here. And so, you know, um, the plants that have small, uh, under four and a half frequency, uh, there's only five of them. Um, and we get this nice bell shaped curve where a few of them, it looks like about five or six, uh, have very long sepal length. Um, and then the most fall in this middle here. So, you know, the bell shaped curve is very much a common occurrence in nature. Normal distribution. It's beautiful to see, especially if you're a geneticist, because that means usually there's some sort of genetic underpinning to it. Um, so let's uh, let's take this a little further. So let's do the same. Well, yeah, let's do the same one. Um, but instead, what we're gonna do? Actually, let's quick call um, his down here. And so, as you can see, um, we have histogram. One thing that we can do is called breaks. Um, and so, let's modify this. And we're going to say there's going to be 25 breaks. And you, as you can see, what that does is it makes the bins more bins, right? So it breaks it into a lot more sections. Um, see if you click over between plots and viewer here underneath my camera. Um, at the top there's plots of viewer. Um, you can go back and forth. Um, 
So we can also do right, so here, oh, um, annotate, annotate, annotate. Um, let's increase the number of bins in our sticker. So why you would do this is it, it gives you more of an idea of how the distribution breaks down. So if we looked at it the first time, it was very bell-shaped. Here you see it's a little, like the bell shapes getting a little bit more noise in it, right? So for some reason, uh, we have kind of some peaks and valleys up here. Um, so you can look at your data in different ways uh, by changing the bin number. Um, so let's take this same thing, just copy it, set it right down here space it um, and let's add some uh, labels how's that sound so let's do X lab so remember if we go to the help here um, we can do your X la uh, label you can set your range of your a and X access um, you can change the border there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do um, so we're going to do our X label is going to be called uh, sepal width. I know this is, wait, do we like the width? Length. And remember that has to be in quotations because it's looking for uh, characters. Uh, so the main, so it's like the title of your graph, is uh, sepal length frequency. And see how that looks. Beautiful, look, so now up here we have sepal length frequency, we have sepal length down here, frequency on the side. Um, if you want, you could change that to count by saying Y lab equals count, um, I think frequency is fine. Um, okay, so that's kind of uh, the histograms, uh, simple kind of bar charts. Um, let's look at another type of graph. So let's do, um, let's do a kind of a dot plot, right? So we have iris, We'll do that dot plot that we did with the correlation. Um, uh, uh, where we did length by width correlation. And let's give us some labels. X label equals, uh, what did we do for X? X label, label equals length. And then Y label. Okay. And let's try plotting this. So the function here is just called plot. And it will automatically just do a regular dot plot, right? Um, so as you can see, we get kind of this correlation. Um, it's kind of sloppy. I'm surprised that the... Oh, um, it, so if we were to subset it, we could do it by species. Um, here, let's try this. So. I'm gonna call a library. So we're gonna get into packages and stuff. Um, actually, let's do. So when we get more into the packages, I'll explain this a little bit more. Um, did I spell that wrong? All right, um, maybe it's, oh, it's already installed. Okay, so um, library lattice. So we're gonna run that and it will add it to our environment. Um, a lot of the packages that are in your library or that are um, installed but not used, they don't load them because if you loaded all the packages that are, you just, it's a waste of computing power. Um, so you have to call them in, and so in this case we're calling in Lattice. Um, so now we're going to do, so if we look at Lattice, oops, I should have done that in my console. Uh, let's do that down there. So um, it's an add-on package um, for our um, And there are different functions within this package, 
right? So um, we got dot plot, we have bar plots, box and whiskers, kernel densities, etc. Um, and so we're going to use the dot plot. Let's use the lattice dot plot and see if we can get a nice picture out of here, right? So let's do dot plot. And we'll do the sepal width by sepal length. And then we're going to use this vertical uh, break, which is above your enter. And then we'll type species. And then data equals iris. Okay. Okay, so see what happens here is this dot plot is calling the same thing where it says, all right, let's do a regression or a, you know plot x and y sepal width against sepal length. But we're gonna subset that and do this for each of the species. So as you can see, we have virginica, uh, setosa, and vesicolor. Um, and then for each of those species, it did the sepal width of that species versus the sepal length of that species. And you can see when we compare, we can actually also, uh, this little arrow here will let you go through the different graphs that you've done. Um, so you can see the correlation here between sepal width and sepal length by species is pretty strong. Like if you were to draw a line through these, um, it'd be a, a very strong correlation. Here, and you can and sort of see, this appears to be this vesicolor uh, data that is down here. And this is kind of a mismatch of the other two, of the virginica and the uh, setosa that are kind of overlapping right here. But this is kind of a subset here. Um, so this is a nice way to be able to do these facet plots where you have uh, multiple graphs put onto the same figure um, if you have you know different subsets of your data set like species or treatment or uh, if you're doing public health the counties or the by state or however else you want to uh, divide it up okay and so um, Let's also do, let's do one more. Just for, I was gonna say, S and giggles. Um, let's do pedal length uh, for the same data set. And we'll do it by species as well. Data equals, we could say data equals data set um, or iris. This should be the same because we just called the iris data set and renamed it to data set, the word data set. Um, so let's try this. So as you can see here, uh, we did the pedal length um, and there's pretty strong correlations here as well. Uh, pedal width by pedal length, uh, maybe not so much in Satosa because it's just kind of one blob, but in Vesicolor, it seems very. Uh, strongly correlated. Virginica, yeah, we're not running the stats on them, so I, I'm not going to get too heavy into that. Um, let's quick annotate this. Um, let's use the plot to look at pedal length versus width. So, that's it. Uh, that's kind of our basics. I just want to give you a brief introduction into the plotting. And at the very beginning of this lecture, um, I was saying, you know, oh, R makes these gorgeous graphs and stuff. Um, and then you look over at the graphs that we just made, and uh, they're not the best graphs. There are better packages that make much more refined graphs, and we didn't change a lot of the um, parameters. Like you can change font sizes and things like that to make them very, very high quality. Um, this was just a very, very brief uh, introduction. You can have quite a few lines of code to make a very spectacular graph. Um, we'll have better graphs when we get into uh, the uh, next generation sequencing or the differential gene expression analysis stuff where we do like volcano plots and heat maps and things that look really cool. Um, 
But like I said, just want to give you a brief introduction. If you're interested in one of the, I'm going to take a sidebar here. It's important to be able to, when you do data analysis, to be able to relay that information um, in the most clear and convenient way possible. I'm sure you've read scientific papers before where you've looked at the figures and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, and so making clear and concise figures and, and eye appealing figures is very important for uh, displaying information and passing that information around, especially if you're in like a health setting or something where you want the layman to be able to, or laywoman, uh, to uh, be able to digest that data and and act accordingly upon it, whether you know giving health advice or drug interaction information or COVID information or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, so I'm a little bit you can see I'm a little passionate for uh, for making very nice figures uh, because it kind of reflects on on your work as well. So. Um, that's all I got for you. Uh, I hope you like this lecture. Um, I'll see you in the next one.